So we're just going to, before we start this afternoon's um, uh, 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 speaker list, we just want to go back to this morning. If you notice, the second item on our agenda from this morning was an update from the United Nations General Assembly meeting on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on universal health care. And so it's very apropos, obviously, to our discussion this afternoon, because the United Nations was dealing with these very exact issues. So I want to uh, invite Jean-Claude Mugumba from Partners in Health, who was there, to just give us an update as to what, what's going on in that space and what happened at the meeting. Jean-Claude, just you. for like seven minutes or so. Be quick, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Everyone, so I'm very honored to be here and uh, speak to you all at this conference. And you might be wondering why a person connected from PIH, uh, but also for those who know me, I'm a physician from Rwanda, will be uh, not pleased or having an opinion out there that says that the historical declaration undermines health as a human right. All of the conversations, obviously, we've been having kind of points to where I'm headed with this one. Um, so basically, I was also out of nowhere, a privilege, an opportunity, I would say, to be in New York at the General Assembly. And that was uh, culminating to a political declaration, the highest commitment from all of the countries in terms of uh, providing health care as a human right. And that, to me, was sandwiched between the two main historical events, Alma-Ata. So I, born, I was born right after Alma-Ata in 83. So I was one of those kids, really, the beneficiaries of growth monitoring. And right there in my village of Rwanda. And um, it's really the typical kind of case, I would say. And as reflected back as a provider and also, hopefully, a partner, a thought partner with you guys on how to do this right. It takes me to those days. I can't help myself other than going back in those 83. What can I remember? What was happening? What's in real life? And how many kids who are around me will, will like, you know, I believe in the statistics, uh, kind also had the chance or have a chance to have a, a privilege and a talk here or go to the UN um, less than, I mean, if you take four kids, maybe, I'm the only one who will make it here. or Because if you look at what they are still up against, what was happening there. By the time I grew up right after Mata, my mom had five kids, and we were trying to all survive the poverty as well as illnesses. And what was appearing was the change that we didn't see with our brothers and sisters. I'm the youngest of the five. The new flashy printed out vaccination cards were starting to emerge. We were being checked for growth monitoring. I didn't see, I think my mom was being taught also on how to cook protein food and including chicken, but I didn't see any chicken in our houses. I wish we had the chicken other than just like she learned how to do it, but those proteins were not available really. So here to tell you that even though I went back and read the declaration of Almata, to my surprise, to find way more than what was delivered right there, to find out there was more than a sixth intervention, to find out that even those interventions are focusing on teaching a mom on how to feed in a, in a village, assuming she didn't know how to, I, I would say she did. And um, growth monitoring, right now as we speak, I have a sister who stayed in the same village house I grew up, she has six kids herself, um, one in four kids in Rwanda, by the way, is still stunted. So despite all of the interventions focusing all of that. So to me, New York was like a special event, but also I didn't know where to put my feet, where to stand in all of the discourses dominating, and also knowing that this 40 years later, another kid who will be able to survive a cancer, Wilms tumor, one of the highest curable cancer care, but cancer, but they cannot get treatment just because they are in a village of a poor country, the six, seven countries, them, not us. We are talking about, the use, even here, I noticed that we are saying they and us, I'm definitely they. And I hope you two are part of they. We can't have they, it's us, right? So with all of the progress that Wanda has made, I still send my sister the money to buy insurance premium 
for all of the kids because she can't afford it. And she doesn't qualify part of those lower level subdesired people because she has a brother who lives in the US. So migration is connected to all of this. And if it's not connected in our mind, it's connected to those who design community health insurance in Rwanda because they factor in that I'm here and I'm responsible for that insurance premium for my nieces, six. <clears throat> so when I saw this declaration, I was like, oh, I'm no longer alone to do this. There is a global solidarity. There is a un uh, equity built into this. And then uh, the draft that we saw before it was adopted was so disappointing in a way that all of the scientists of the world, maybe I thought they were, they were lazy. So why? Because no specifics on how you achieve that we are six, uh, 11 years away from the 2030 goal. And then we were like, for us as a global community to avoid the same disappointment to the kids that uh, who will come similar, in the similar fashion I came over, how, why don't we get to the specifics? In 11 years, this is what we will provide. And then, then, and then we say, this is a person who's gonna pay for it. So the declaration had two issues. It explicitly says that countries need to choose a set of services and they can afford and they try to find resources, be efficient with the current resources and try to achieve UHC by then. That's when I was like, okay, again, the lazy economist of the world, I don't wanna be one of them. I will skip all of these years and then I go to the what it will take to achieve what we are, we are talking about is I run the numbers and I say a country like Rwanda that has a gap of millions of dollars to achieve a UHC, even though despite the progress, if you tell them to do this close the gap nationally and to be national heroes, it won't work. It's just an empty promise. It's just something you have to prioritize. I'm not against prioritizing, but I'm against choosing the cheap. I'm against choosing the most comfortable for them, not for us, and then say we've done something instead of procrastinating over something big. So if we are talking about something, uh, the fruit of modern medicine, for a kid who is in that village, for someone who is uh, handicapped. So once they get near this tree of health care, modern health care, and actual like quality, high quality health care, you won't tell me that it's cool enough to have somebody be closer to the tree, not able to reach the fruit. So that to me, it's, it's like uh, I use some of the analogies in, uh, when I came first in the US here, the hiring question was, how much did you make in your previous job? I, I'm a physician, I'd not made more than 10,000 a year, ever, anywhere. But then I'm interviewing for jobs that I'm looking for a salary more than seven times higher than that. So my question, my, my answer was like, what's this question? It's, it's meant to give someone who has never had something, if you give them a little, they will be happy. I have an issue with that. So if you don't have money, we're saying that UHC is uh, comprehensive or for everyone to buy them this supportive, like uh, this looks like bricks they can stand on or it w this wheelchair need to stand on something, they need to reach the fruit. And to reach the fruit, somebody has to pay for this support, uh, whatever they, they, they need to stand on to reach these fruits. And that's the money we are talking about. This morning, some of us said it's expensive. It's not. I will tell you why it's not. Because it's the way we look at it, and somebody helped me earlier, it was like, oh, the technocrats are very restrictive. Yes, thank you, that was so much what we are talking about. Right now, we've done some calculations. 67 low and middle-income countries are facing 50 to 100 million US dollars every year if they are going to achieve UHC. UHC, not some UHC for people in some countries and some UH, the level of UHC in some other countries, if we mean UHC, so we're estimating that gap. And they won't be able to mobilize that domestically. We've run some numbers and we think they won't also be able to do that. And then in addition to that, every year, those countries are paying a combined at least 20 million in loans they took out after colonial to build the roads, to even achieve, uh, you know, roads that in some cases can be argued, this tarmac road in some countries uh, will resource extraction a type of infrastructure, but 
18, 18 million or 20 million is going there every year instead of going in that gap. In addition to that, there is all of these global taxes abuse multinational companies and we've and then uh, the all of that we've quantified around 650 million a year of that that's not very quite um an exact amount but 650 and then we're talking about 50 and 100 million so it's more not like there is a way to cover that gap but you also need to leave me alone not steal from me, and if you think I can be prosperous, we need to talk about the global order, as people here talked about. Immigration uh, and all of that, it's all connected. So I will jump to the next slide and show you what I envision, at least I believe, the UN missed when we were in, uh, in New York. It's something that, it's a list. It's a list much longer than what Professor Walsh presented here. I can uh, connect with you, I will show you. Some of the folks who are learning to do this, it starts from community. You go to health centers, you go to the hospital, you make sure if I break my head somewhere in that village, someone needs to give me trauma surgery so I will be able to have, come at Harvard at some point and talk to you guys. And then at PIH, we also believe that once you do comprehensive, not just selective, you also have to make sure it's done by public, because right now the discussion that some technocrats we are talking about, privatizing a public hospital, creating some private VIP wings, so the rich can pay and subsidize the poor, that's the new discourse. That's a destruction. It's not an apple, that's gonna be a banana, we have to stop that one as well. And then I will end up with saying, nothing without us, Nothing for us without us, because if we sit here at Harvard without listening to people, how this selective or priority is going to impact their lives, it's going to be tough. And then the planetary health, folks who are in those countries, they will tell you how many nights they sleep without food because of all of the climate change, the droughts and all of that. It not only is affecting them, but it's all connected. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jean-Claude. I'm, I'm loath to not give you more time because you, what you're saying is so uh, significant. And I think we're seeing this, I just want to bring out one very salient point, and that is that history doesn't begin in 1978. There's been 500 years of uh, what some might consider pillaging that, pre, you know, that, that precedes that. And so when we're thinking about what the transfer of resources should look like, or how do you actually, uh, you know, should we be dealing with rights or not rights? Like what is going on here? How do you actually frame the repair that needs to be done vis-a-vis -vis health in these places, many of which were former colonies? It becomes a very complex question. Which leads us to our next session, and I'm gonna hand over to Professor Mary Jo Good, who's Professor Emeritus in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine to lead us through this discussion uh, of rights. Professor Mary Jo Good. Okay. So we, our first speaker is uh, Zeke Emanuel, and um, I feel as though um, I get a chance to actually welcome Zeke back. Um, he's the most cited bioethicist in history, as well as being head of the Department of Bioethics and uh, Health Policy at Penn, and head of uh, the, pro he's vice provost of uh, global health also at Penn. So right to health, does it make sense from the most cited bioethicist? I recall your work on uh, end of life. So it's a, a, a pleasure to be here, uh, and um, I don't do global health at Penn. I actually do global initiatives, which goes well beyond health, and I'm not responsible for the global health stuff at Penn. Let me begin with uh, three points. The first is just to think through the, some of the uh, key elements of the uh, Alma-Ata Declaration. I want to highlight five. It's hardly comprehensive. I want to talk about some of the successes of Alma-Ata and then some of the uh, key uh, failures. So first, uh, the Declaration famously uh, defined uh, the attainment of the highest possible level of complete physical, mental, and social well-being as the most important worldwide social goal, um, which seems uh, a bit grandiose. Um, it also defined health as a human right, uh, condemning inequalities between developed and developing countries and within countries is unacceptable. 
Third, it uh, declared that fantastic goal of health for all by 2000. Um, it, fourth, um, it recognized that health requires uh, social and economic development, um, and therefore improving health requires addressing social, what we now call social determinants of health, such as the food supply, housing, transportation, et cetera. And last, it put, as we all know, primary care as the foundation of health. So let me just highlight three, what I take to be three successes of the declaration. First, um, it had an important effect on pushing the world to expand the investment in health and try to expand coverage. Um, I think it also pushed a uh, more comprehensive notion of uh, that linked health and social and economic development, uh, recognizing that healthcare is not an island, which we have done so much of, uh, but is influenced and part of uh, other social sectors, and that if you want to improve health, healthcare may not be the most important element at all. I think this is something we keep learning over and over again every generation, but it's fundamentally important because we waste so much damn money in healthcare. Last, um, it pushed health a as a human right. But we also need to recognize some key failures. Um, the definition of health widely viewed as unrealistic. The highest possible level of anything is uh, probably not a good goal um, uh, for a whole lot of reasons. Um, it's also important, as I asked of uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Professor Steele, uh, primary care did not become the focus of health over the last uh, uh, decades. Um, uh, in fact, the focus was much more disease specific, uh, HIV, AIDS, malaria, maternal fetal health, and uh, we should be pretty blunt. Um, there's been a lot of success in those domains. Uh, since 2004, HIV deaths have been down 56%. Since 2010, malaria deaths are down 28%, and since 1990, infant mortality is down worldwide over 50%. Those are huge achievements, and we should not minimize them, and those are achievements in a short period of time, and they've been achieved primarily, and it's not my favorite way of doing it, um, by uh, disease-focused uh, interventions. And I think um, uh, that's just a, a – we didn't do the – all. Alma-Alta approach. We did something else, and it did work. Um, and I say that lot, despite lots of talk about the importance of focusing on social determinants, whether it's taxes of smoking and alcohol or better roads, et cetera, um, actually integrating social determinants into a budget and giving them the priority that they deserve for promoting health hasn't been something that's really uh, taken off in the last 40 years. It's more taken off in the rhetoric than in the actuality. Um, I think, and I want to focus on three fundamental questions that come out of Alma-Alta, um, and I want to do that in the context of what do we need today? What are the big questions affecting global health today? I take it, uh, especially for universal health care coverage, I take it first, uh, one of the overarching questions that we need to address is what services uh, healthcare systems should give at each stage of development that they're at. Um, we see this over and over, uh, you know, with the proclamation that everyone should get health care um, uh, and, and have a shot at uh, a full life, um, but then the question is which services do we have to, are, are, should get priority. Um, and that related to that is the second question is how much financial risk protection should people get? We know that a lot of financial risk protection is necessary because uh, uh, getting health care can be expensive and thrust people into poverty, and we need to have health coverage in part to avert poverty. And last, we need advice on how to balance uh, uh, various principles that we all pretty much affirm. Efficiency, uh, um, priority to the worst uh, off, um, and a lot of other values, participation, um, that are important, we need to understand how when they conflict, and they will inevitably conflict, we need to balance them. So in light of those pressing questions for countries and health systems, I would suggest that um, there are three questions to raise about the Alma-Ata legacy. One is, does health as a human right help us focus attention, obtain resources, and improve the global health? Second, does defining health as the highest possible anything uh, help? Um, and third, uh, should primary care now be the focus? Well, as you can gather, um, because you need someone to shoot at, 
Uh, I'm the guy who thinks that health as a human right makes no sense. Um, I don't think, and I actually think that uh, I, on this, uh, despite the language uh, and the title uh, by Danielle Steele, she also, in some sense, undercuts the importance of using a rights framework. Um, what is a human right? Well, um, first of all, it's a right, uh, which means that it imposes duties and responsibilities on other people, um, which is very important. Second, human rights are plural. Health is not the only human right. Um, most importantly, I think they're universal. They apply to everyone everywhere. Um, there's no special category. That's what it means to be a human right. Um, and by being a right, a human right is a uh, highest priority. It's paramount importance. It sort of has this, what we call uh, now, I guess no longer do we use the word, but it's a trump card. Um, and we uh, uh, say that it has more priority than other things. Um, what's the point of calling something a human right? Well, it gets to attention and it demands action by other people because they have a responsibility. Well, I would suggest that there are several problems with calling health a human right. The first is not everyone agrees on what are human rights, and we've spent a lot of time arguing about them. More importantly, we have to look under human rights to resolve those debates and to resolve priorities by looking at the justification and which rights make sense and how we understand those rights. I think that wastes a lot of time. And I think what you saw by uh, Professor Steele was a move to not talk about the rights, but let's talk about underlying conceptions, whether it's empowerment or equity, because those inform, first of all, how we understand the rights and uh, the notion of the right to health care. Um, and so I would argue that what we have to do is ask ourselves, why is health important and why do we think people ought to have health and in some ways be guaranteed health? Um, and if you unpack health as a human right, I think you come out with one of two conceptions, although uh, Professor Steele added uh, at least one other that we can argue about. Um, one is we think that health is important because it's important to human agency and autonomy. It is hard to live a flourishing life unless you have uh, health, at least health for a prolonged period of time. Um, and so the reason we think it's so important is that it empowers uh, people, uh, not necessarily in the way that Danielle Steele meant, political empowerment, but in the way that we think about empowerment in order to live your own full uh, life. Um, and it is, for that reason, a fundamental interest of people. Now, if we keep those in mind, um, it seems to me those are pretty uncontroversial claims. Uh, they are claims that all of us recognize, um, and they're the way we can invoke a justification for uh, putting priority on funding health. Um, and it seems to me that it's that notion, that health is important to autonomy and individual, individuals living a flourishing life, that is actually doing the intellectual and moral work of asking people and asking people to uh, put resources behind guaranteeing uh, adequate health care and health for people around the world. Um, because it is such a fundamental interest of everyone who wants to live a full life, that is why we want to do it. And I don't think we advance the argument by then encasing it in rights. Um, I think uh, we have to focus in on the underlying uh, rationale. Um, so if you want to ask what services we should guarantee, Saying it's a right doesn't help you because that suggests it's unlimited, and I'll go on to that in a second. On the other hand, saying if you want to guarantee people an autonomy and a, a way to live a full and flourishing life, it does provide you some perch on addressing the questions I raised at the start. What services to guarantee? How much financial protection do you need? And how do you balance out these other values of the worst off efficiency, participation, et cetera? And so I think inevitably we're drawn to the underlying justifications of human rights and adding the gloss of a human right does not actually help in some ways. It hurts by distracting us from the fundamental uh, question. The one exception I would argue that rights actually do serve the, the rights language can serve, is this universality element. Um, but uh, I'm not sure, it, it's not the only way you can sort of uh, intuitively get people to accept the universality of everyone uh, by talking about human rights. And I do think the underlying notion of uh, uh, um, 
life, liberty, and uh, uh, pursuit of happiness does help you uh, very much uh, uh, in terms of universality. The second question is, should health be the maximum attainable well-being, or should we think about it in terms of a minimal threshold? Um, maximal attainable is a very high threshold. And uh, most people who think of human rights more generally, uh, uh, people like Chuck Bites and others, think of them as minimal thresholds, not as maximal uh, uh, attainable anythings. Uh, people who defend human rights view, view them as thresholds above which individuals are left to themselves. Um, uh, and you see this in Alma Ata and in other declarations when people talk about an adequate standard of living. You saw this in some of the declarations that uh, Professor Steele mentioned. Uh, so the question is adequate health or maximal well-being that trumps all other, that is the most important social goal in the world. Um, I think if we think in terms of what does it take for a person to live an autonomous, full, good life, um, we think of adequate and we don't think of maximum. Uh, the other problem with maximum is they become a kind of resource black holes. Because some person is not at the maximum, it is very hard to say no when the goal has to be some maximum. And we clearly need to avoid resource black holes in healthcare. Um, we are, after all, in the United States where healthcare is a resource black hole, where it seems an unlimited amount can be poured into it. Um, and a maximum is a never-ending demand. In this regard, um, uh, I think that a maximum is counterproductive to answering the questions of what healthcare services should you uh, guarantee people at, in low-income countries, in low-middle-income countries, et cetera. Uh, the maximum doesn't help. Everything available in the world is what you would say. That is both uh, impractical and unrealistic, and it seems to me part of what a adequate does is provides a better way of answering that kind of question. It also, I think, provides us a very important standard by which we evaluate the success or failure of our activities in global health. Um, I have always liked the notion of years of life lost. Uh, how much how many people are, for how long a time, do you not get to 70 or 75? Um, that, I think, is a very good measure of the inadequacy of the system. If everyone got to an average age of 75, um, would we then be upset that everyone was not getting to the maximal? It seems to me not. It seems to me people can live a rich, flourishing life uh, and uh, if they have health and years to 75, and that we do not have obligations beyond that to get them to maximal uh, well-being uh, until 90 or 100. But that's what the language uh, of uh, human rights and the language of Alma Alta suggest. I think thinking of health as a threshold, a threshold to get people uh, um, to 75, is a much better way of thinking than maximal uh, well-being. Last question I raised is, um, should primary care be the focus of health investment going forward? Um, as I mentioned, I think it's a fair assessment of the last uh, 30, 40 years to say that we've made these huge strides in global health, even if we're not anywhere near the goal of uh, getting everyone to 75, by emphasizing disease and uh, maternal health. Um, I, am, I don't like that. I don't like that focus. Uh, but I also think we need to recognize that it's actually had a big impact. Uh, that drop in malaria, that drop in HIV uh, mortality is not something uh, uh, that we got without uh, the disease focus. On the other hand, I would say that the Ebola crisis in West Africa um, and in uh, ongoing crises in various places um, awake us to the problem of the deficiencies of that disease focus and the need to uh, uh, have health system strengthening. And I would agree, and I do think it's right, that if we are focused on strengthening health systems um, at the core, uh, we have to have primary care. And by investing and focusing on primary care, we will strengthen health systems. 
That's important, as I cite, as I suggested, uh, made very, very obvious by the uh, Ebola crisis and the deficiencies in the health systems in the three West African countries. Um, but it's going to become even more important uh, with the explosion of non-communicable diseases in, throughout the world. Uh, you, we can address some communicable diseases like malaria uh, um, and others uh, uh, by uh, disease focus. But you can't address hypertension, diabetes, asthma, COPD that are going to become so prevalent uh, by uh, just a disease focus. You need to address those by functioning health systems that does put primary care at its center. And so in some sense, I think Alma Atta was prescient uh, in anticipating uh, that problem and in anticipating the importance of uh, primary care as the foundation of uh, getting health uh, to all people, especially when we have this uh, impending transition between communicable and non-communicable diseases. Um, we, I would suggest that the big questions for us going forward is not, is healthcare a human right or not? Um, and uh, should we have maximal attainable uh, uh, well-being as the goal? But the fundamental questions are what should universal health coverage guarantee people um, and at what stages of a country and a health system's development, um, and that is the uh, question, and, and, and getting that clear on that and getting clear on how to find the resources to put that in place is going to be the key question, uh, certainly over the next uh, 20 years going forward. And I think that uh, the two issues I've raised um, uh, two of the three issues I've raised. Uh, does human rights help you on that? I don't think so. And is maximal social well-being uh, the best way to address that question? I don't think so again. I am pretty sure, though, that putting primary care front and center is going to be fundamental to ensuring people have whatever package of right of uh, health care services we think are fundamental uh, as part of uh, universal health care coverage. Thank you. Um, we'd like to a invite Don, Dr. Norman to, uh, Norhim to come. And Dr. Norhim is um, at Berrigan. He's um, a physician and as well as a, um, as a um, public health person. He's pu published widely in uh, the uh, Lancet and is on the Commission on Poverty and also on Health Systems Quality. Uh, for Lancet. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll talk about the uh, idea of uh, progressive realization of <laughs> UHC, and I will argue that it's quite compatible with the idea of the progressive realization of the right to health. So I have a slightly more positive take on the right to health than Zeke, I think. So uh, I'll start with the right to health, um, and I'll start with my kind of inspiration for the work I do, it's very much the type of theories of distributive justice uh, that we find in Amartya Sen's work, for instance. And he has developed a quite interesting theory of rights, uh, which incorporates both consequences and distribution and process. So that would be uh, my key uh, ideas here that I want to present. But I want to go back a little bit in history. I appreciate that this morning's discussion of uh, the history of, of Alma Atta and the uh, idea of the right to health. So if we go back to 1966, the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, we see that there is actually a lot of emphasis on financing, fair financing of health services, like in, the, uh, in England when the NHS was introduced. It was not primarily to protect people's health, but to protect their income. So I think that's uh, quite interesting to see this emphasis here. And then in this 
general comment 14 from the year 2000, the right to health was specified in somewhat more detail that I find interesting. So it's about the right of access to health facilities, also access to the determinants of health, food, shelter, and then essential drugs. And to ensure equitable distribution of all health facilities, goods, and services. And that the state have an obligation to develop a national uh, public health strategy. So it's pretty vague, uh, but it contains some very important elements, uh, I would argue. They don't talk about quality here. And I've seen in some of my work and work with uh, Margaret Crook that securing equitable distribution of health fac facilities is not the only thing. If it's without quality, it doesn't help. So recently, I think we have advanced our understanding much more on how to think about health systems as well. Uh, Alicia Yamin, uh, who is at the law school, has written very nicely, uh, interestingly, I think, on the right to health. And she has emphasized this strong focus on equitable financing, on equitable access to services, especially on non-discrimination and marginalized groups, power structures and structural violence, the determinants of health, and a lot on uh, the process of decision-making, of agency. So the right to health is not only to receive services, but to be able to influence uh, what is received. Uh, and transparent process, yes. But as many have observed, and as Zeke also mentioned, the right to health approach is maybe not e enough attentive to resource constraints and alternative costs. So that would be my main criticism. So let me talk about then progressive realization of UHC. And I'll base my talk on uh, some work I did. I chaired a, a committee on equity and universal health coverage. Uh, this report was published in uh, 2014. WHO asked us to provide guidance for countries who want to move from where they are towards UHC. What kind of choices should they make? And, uh, this report is very much uh, uh, informed by theories of distributive justice and the, the notion of fairness or equity. Uh, it's about the distribution of benefits and burdens in society. That's key. And we started by criticizing the definition of UHC, which is nice in many ways. It includes quality health services, meeting the needs without being exposed to financial hardship. But we argue that a country like Ethiopia who has available $32 per capita. That's where they are now, including government expenditure, including out-of-pocket expenditure, and including overseas aid. They cannot provide everything. They have other goals, education, infrastructure, etc. So we have to take this into account and think about how to move towards <coughs> UHC. In Norway, where I come from, we spend $8,000 per capita. It's impossible for Ethiopia to do that. So we have to give these countries some advice, and they are working on this, uh, how to make these choices on the path to UHC. And uh, of course, we started with this famous cube. So if this is Ethiopia, the blue part of this, how do they expand? They can expand by expanding services population in need and reducing out-of-pocket expenditures. And of course, there are trade-offs in which way you move, and that's what we uh, gave recommendations on. So we, to summarize what our recommendations, we said, and this was the first time, I think, in a WHO publication of this kind, uh, or in the UHC uh, literature that we said, you have to start with prioritizing services. Very much like Julia uh, said this morning, I think. Um, services have to be prioritized. And when you have defined, so you have to say that vaccines, maternal care is more important than, than renal dialysis on the path to UHC. You want to end there, but you cannot start there. And that means that as a second step, uh, expand coverage for these high priority services and include out of pocket expenditures for these. And you have to have a robust financing mechanism with mandatory progressive prepayment with pooling of funds. 
But even with these funds at the first stage of development, you cannot cover everything. So you can only aim to reduce co-payment for the high priority services. And three, while doing so, ensure that disadvantaged groups are not left behind. And these will often include low-income groups and other disadvantaged groups. So that's the uh, recommendation quickly summarized. A little bit more detail. So we recommended that services should be prioritized. It includes both uh, treatment and, and prevention. Not necessarily selective. You can prioritize, and, and DCP, the Disease Control Priorities Project, demonstrates that it's possible to look first at community health services, uh, define the most important services at that level at primary care. There will be a few at secondary care and even fewer at tertiary care. But it's meant to be comprehensive. But you ca cannot do everything at the same time. And there needs to be a process around this in each country, how to uh, rank services. This, cannot, this has to be based on the values and the context of each country, of course. But we recommended and summarized uh, three principles and criteria for priority setting that is widely discussed and everyone in our group agreed on this. And the first was cost effectiveness. And since I'm a professor of medical ethics, I have to say that it, uh, in my view, it would be unethical not to consider cost effectiveness because it embodies uh, this idea of alternative costs. If you spend a million dollar, if the government of Ethiopia spends a million dollar on renal dialysis, which they might do, they cannot spend, spend those dollars on vaccines or saving kids. So that's a fact in my view. Doesn't mean that cost effectiveness is the only thing. It will very often conflict with other objectives and other values. And one second very important value is equity or priority to the worse off. Priority to the worse off meaning either in terms of health, those who die prematurely or suffer from mental health, suffer in their opportunities to live a meaningful and good life. So if there is a conflict between maximizing health and distributing health equally, uh, we, there has to be a trade-off. So both these criteria are extremely important. And third, we argue that financial risk protection could also be relevant. We know that a lot of countries have set up catastrophic health funds for very expensive services. So in Thailand, for instance, they argued that renal dialysis should be uh, part of, of UHC because it pushed people into poverty. So that's a legitimate uh, reason for inc including something uh, in, the, in the essential package. But there is a trade-off here because if you provide a lot of financial risk protection, you might lose a lot of health. So these are trade-offs and we believe at least these three criteria are important. And as I said, there needs to be an open, transparent process in applying these criteria and going through relevant interventions to be prioritized at each, each level of the healthcare system. Second, and this is probably the most important, countries have to shift away from out-of-pocket payment and toward mandatory prepayment with pooling of funds. I think that was the most important contribution of the World Health Report of 2010. This new focus on fair financing and giving countries advice on how to mobilize resources. And we can talk a lot about the right to health, but if countries are not able to get together their uh, tax system, the tax base for mobilizing resources, redistributing resources, it's very hard to move towards UHC. But when they make this shift, we recommend that they should first eliminate out-of-pocket payments for high-priority services. So you cannot do everything at the same time. And uh, also to uh, prioritize low-income groups, the poor, other disadvantaged groups, if it can be done effectively. And three, how to include everyone. So we recommended, of course, that when you expand your high-priority services, make sure that everyone is covered. And especially uh, think about the worst off groups in terms of income the hard to reach populations, women and other relevant groups that are systematically uh, disadvantaged. 
And we use one example for vaccines, for instance, it might be more efficient to increase coverage for vaccines in the big cities, but you might have hard to reach groups that are more costly. And then again, there will be a trade-off, but we recommended a very strong emphasis on equal access. So the idea would be, you, the social gradient, the marmot gradient that you all know, the idea would be to reduce that inequality by lifting everyone up to the highest possible level. That would be the path towards UHC in, uh, in our recommendation. So summarizing this part, we recommended that countries need to categorize services into priority classes, expand coverage for high priority services to everyone, so make it universal, and ensure that the disadvantaged groups are not left behind. We talk a lot about trade-offs in, in this report, uh, and uh, priority setting is all about trade-offs, but we also proposed something that we called unacceptable trade-offs, and this is inspired by the rights language. So, for instance, we said that to expand coverage for low or medium priority services before there is near universal coverage for high priority services, that would be unfair and unacceptable. So if a country is considering to introduce heart transplant, in Ethiopia, for instance, heart transplant, before completing the agenda of, uh, of providing vaccines, treatment for pneumonia, all these high priority things, that's unfair and it's inefficient and th therefore uh, unacceptable. Another example of an unacceptable trade-off, we discuss the way countries often start introducing uh, health insurance by uh, starting with the civil servants. We say that to first include UHC scheme only for ser civil servants because it's, it's easier and not including informal workers and the poor, uh, that is unacceptable. And we also know that it won't work. If you don't include everyone from the start, you will not be able to reach UHC. Look at many of the uh, Latin American countries that are struggling with different systems and uh, struggling with harmonizing these different systems. So uh, my summary here would be uh, that this idea of a progressive realization of UHC moving in a fair way towards UHC. We only have 11 years, so it might be hard, but at least we point in, in the right direction, I think, would be compatible with this idea of progressive realization of the right to health. I have a caveat here, of course. UHC is not about the determinants of health, so we need to think about that in addition. But if and countries have signed up to SDG 3.8, UHC is a global target now, mm -hmm. and I think we should see the progressive realization of UHC as something uh, very positive and very important. And this means that we have to focus on fair financing. Countries have to mobilize resources, and there's a lot of talk of innovative uh, resource mobilization. And I saw a tweet once who said, there's only one thing uh, called uh, innovative resource mobilization, and that's taxation. So countries need to find out how to mobilize uh, the resources within the country. And we might need to add, uh, for some countries, uh, overseas development aid. It might be important for, for many countries for still some years. The reason why this is important is that a universal healthcare system is redistributive. It redistributes resources, income, from the rich and the young to the sick and the old. So I've lived in a system of UHC in Norway all my life. I know that it works. I know it's hard to get there, but I think that's the key of UHC. It also means fair inclusion, not being uh, um, uh, discriminating, including everyone. It's a big debate about uh, illegal migrants. We didn't tackle that in, in, in this report, but I think that's also important to discuss. And then I argue that we need to make priorities and that they should be fair. And that will include both taking cost, cost effectiveness into consideration, priority to the worse off and financial risk protection. And finally, 
And this we can learn a lot from, I think, uh, uh, the human rights approach. You need an open, transparent process. These are decisions to be made by those who are affected by these decisions. Thank you. Chair in Medical Ethics at UConn, and she's also a professor of community medicine and healthcare. She's involved in the High Commission on Human Rights and UNESCO, and has priorities um, in her research to um, improve health coverage for the poor. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting, particularly Scott, for inviting me to participate. This has been an incredibly stimulating day, and I have also appreciated the opportunity to finally have a face to put to so many of the people whose works I've been reading for many years. As you can see from the title of my presentation, I also support human rights and have spent much of my professional career involved with human rights. Uh, although there is a seeming international consensus about the importance of universal health care and the list of documents on the screen, including the political declarations signed by all countries participating in the high-level meeting on universal health coverage in September. We all know that signing onto documents does not necessarily mean a serious commitment, or the overwhelming majority of countries would have already achieved the right to health for their populations. And particularly since my own country signed this declaration, I know that signatures on a page mean very little. <laughs> uh, also, as we look at statistics on universal health coverage, they are going in the wrong direction if we are truly committed to achieving universal health coverage in, a, in the next 11 years. According to recent WHO figures in 2017, only about one-third to one-half of the world's population were covered by essential health services. And if the current trend were to continue, uh, they expect that by 2030, it would only be between 39 and 63 percent, which is better than it is now but certainly not universal health coverage. Also, and sadly, globally and in many countries, the pace of progress has actually slowed since 2010. Uh, my concern is that poor people in these countries have lower coverage even for basic services such as immunization, sanitation, and antenatal care. And usually those in rural areas have significantly lower coverage than in urban areas. Um, having spent many years in Africa, this situation really disturbs me. Also, uh, another unfortunate trend is that poverty related to healthcare expenses is increasing. The incidence of catastrophic health expenditures increased between 2000 and 2015. And according to the most recent WHO Universal Coverage Monitoring Report, nearly one billion people spent more than 10% of household income on basic health care, and 210 million spent more than 25 percent. So increasingly, people are being impoverished by health care expenditures. So what can human rights, or what I would call a human rights model, 
or a human rights approach contribute to this situation in terms of pushing it in the right direction. I think uh, because universal health coverage is recognized as a political choice requiring ongoing commitment from political leaders as well as a paradigm shift in a health system, that anything that we can do to push in that direction is helpful. A majority of countries actually have constitutional provisions with language recognizing the right to health care or the obligation of the government to provide basic health services. And therefore, framing universal health care as a way to fulfill the right to health may provide in additional incentives. But importantly, it may also empower the population to demand coverage. Uh, it's often said that human rights are not granted from above, but they are claimed from below. So I, I think that framing universal health care or universal health coverage as a human right perhaps incentivizes the population to demand it. I also want to emphasize the importance of a pro-poor approach to universal health coverage. Um, and I think that particularly in a situation with the statistics I just presented, obviously choices need to be made. And what uh, has happened to date, and if one looks at the history of the way countries have expanded coverage is that, in fact, they have started with the easiest to reach rather than the most difficult. And often it is workers in the formal sector with those uh, in urban areas. And the problem that is when you begin with those groups, in some cases, you end with those groups as well. And that those who are the most needy, the most vulnerable, <coughs> who have the least income, also don't benefit. The 2015 UN uh, MDG report indicated that the poorest and most disadvantaged people were being left behind and targeted help would be needed to reach these groups. And I think that's what universal health coverage should be first and foremost. It should target those who are the most needy and those who to date have been left behind. Um, the other thing which disturbs me is that uh, because of the weakness in health systems resulting both from a disease emphasis in the last 15 or 20 years and also because of neoliberal ideology, which I have been surprised has been so little discussed up to now, health systems have been weakened across the board. And consequently, um, a number of countries which have at least made a declaration that they are going to try to achieve universal health coverage have decided that they should turn to the private sector and that this will be the way that they will achieve uh, greater coverage. But what does it mean to uh, rely on the private sector? Is the private sector going to establish health services for the poor and to subsidize them? No. Is the private sector going to extend to underserved areas? No. And I think it's only if you frame universal health coverage as a human rights requirement that you're going to have the government and the government investment trying to reach these uh, people. Also, we have seen that the private sector is more interested in tertiary care than primary care. And why is that the case? 
Well, it is the case because you can make more money uh, if you are providing tertiary health care services. So um, a human rights approach does, in its framing, favor poor and disadvantaged populations. Um, and general comment 14, which Ola Norheim spoke about, and which is usually considered to be the primary document interpreting what a right to health care means, uh, prioritizes disadvantaged, poor, and vulnerable community, particularly on lowering barriers for low-income groups, rural populations, women, um, and other vulnerable groups that are often disadvantaged in terms of service coverage, health status, and uh, or both. Uh, another, I think, factor which is very important and why a human rights approach is helpful to poor populations is that the right to health framework embraces both the provision of health services and what they call the underlying and what we usually call the social determinants of health. Uh, a number of um, presentations I think are going to talk about or have already talked about the importance of monitoring. Uh, a human rights approach agrees with the importance of monitoring but also of disaggregation so that you're not getting uh, averages, the average urban, the average rural, the average country population, but you're looking at specific societal sectors, including those that are, and specifically those that are poor and disadvantaged. Um, I think uh, another advantage of a human rights approach is that it requires attention to equity considerations in the design of health systems and the uh, process of expansion uh, in order to ensure equitable distribution of all health facilities, goods, and services, and particularly the importance of measures to reduce financial barriers and respond to unmet needs um, for health and related social services for disadvantaged groups throughout the process of expansion. And you just heard from Ola Norheim the um, methodology that has been suggested to achieve this, and I won't repeat it. Another um, advantage of a human rights approach is that it emphasizes a participatory approach. Up to now, universal health coverage policies have usually been formulated by bureaucrats and implemented in a top-down manner with little consultation uh, with representatives of population groups. However, citizens' preferences and priorities may differ from members of the Ministry of Health especially when painful decisions have to be made about priorities and financing. Therefore, uh, consultation with citizens and the use of a participatory approach is very important. Uh, consulting with the population can also boost public confidence in how priorities are set and help foster accountability and transparency also other human rights norms. In terms of uh, a focus on social determinants of health, about which you've already heard quite a bit today, estimates are that they are actually responsible for 60 to 80 percent of health outcomes uh, rather than the provision of health services our health helpful and important those health services are. And um, as you'll see on the screen, that general comment 14 
in interpreting the right to health uh, extends uh, to access to safe and potable water and adequate sanitation an adequate supply of safe food, nutrition, and housing, healthy occupational and environmental conditions, and access to health-related education and information. And uh, I would argue that in a period in which countries are confronting the problems of climate change, it is even more important to recognize the importance of improving access to the social determinants of health. Thank you. Here is um, Dr. Ray, Professor Ray. It's an extraordinary uh, commitment to Africa. She has. Um, been teaching for 35 years in Rwanda and Botswana and Zimbabwe, excuse me, Botswana and Zimbabwe, and has taught public health students from Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa as well. And it's extraordinary to read her bio sketch. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm going to just talk um, really about what I do. Um, and you can decide which theoretical or conceptual framework that fits in with. Um, I'd like, before I start, to recognize my husband, Professor Farai Madzimbamuto, who has been my collaborator on a lot of the work on maternal health and maternal deaths. Uh, he's an anesthetist, so maternal deaths is an important part of his work. OK. So before I start, I, um, I'd like to say this has been an amazing experience to be here because of the depth and breadth of the concepts that people have been talking about. I'd just like to pick out a couple of things. Um, one is um, the comment we heard this morning that it's the institution and not the ideology when we're talking about health systems, strengthening, or um, primary health care. And I think that actually underlies um, a lot of this and particularly emphasizes our differences in opinion if we have them. And I think uh, people like me, we, um, I, I grew up in India and I did my medical training in Britain. Um, and I went to Zimbabwe in 1983 as part of an Oxfam program recruited by David Sanders, um, which perhaps I'll talk a bit more about tomorrow. But, um, I went there as a person who wanted to support um, a newly emerging country uh, develop its health system because of its emphasis on primary health care. And I went and I worked in a rural mission hospital for two years before um, I got married and moved into Harare. So the, it was the ideology, it was the concept of um, I, I'm afraid to use the word empowerment now, but the concept of supporting the people who had been uh, in the liberation struggle, who'd fought for their independence, who um, mainly lived in the rural areas, and who I believed had the right uh, to whatever health care I could provide for them. Um, and I said earlier that I see the battle in some ways as a power battle between who can persuade the Ministry of Health and, to some extent, the donors who can persuade them to put the money into one part of the health system rather than the other. And whether it's in private-public partnerships or whether it's in uh, the government system, all depends on who has the most power of negotiation in this. And this has changed over time. Um, and the HIV epidemic really knocked us back. I think you could see on the graph that someone showed earlier about the advances in health that Africa pretty much was, was flat, but there was a little peak in the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, uh, a gentle rolling peak, which was the impact of the HIV epidemic, uh, and we still struggle with that. I, I said I'm going to just talk about what, what I do, what we do, um, and my focus is on quality, um, and I'll show you why I have that focus. I'm going to throw some quotes to you. So this is about 
data systems. This is about maternal deaths. Uh, this was one of my MPH students. Um, we were talking about maternal death surveillance, and he said, we've stopped reporting maternal deaths where we think we'll be blamed. This being, uh, blame means being shouted at or worse, being sent for retraining, which is very humiliating, especially when the problem is not that we're not skilled enough. And the retraining, ironically, is usually sending someone back to the tertiary hospital um, where they're learning how, you know, they may be uh, getting retraining in a completely different environment to what they expected to work in. Another one was a midwife who was in a teaching hospital who said, we shout at women in labor because we're afraid that if she doesn't progress, she will have a stillbirth. Every time there's a stillbirth, we're sent to the clinical director and have to wait outside his office knowing that we're going to be shouted at. So you could see there's a lot of shouting going on. And in this particular case, it's because uh, we have targets to meet. Uh, we want to be sure that we don't have stillbirths. So we shout at people, and then they shout at people to try and achieve those targets. And uh, these are quotes, so you could say, oh, well, this might be in exceptional circumstances, but let me tell you it's not. Um, so just quoting the bunch of papers that was in a, a collection in the BMJ, uh, the author, some of the authors are here. Um, so Ashish Jha et al. said, the safety, quality, and efficiency of most healthcare delivery systems are far from the best they could be. So what's that, what that's saying is our day-to-day -day reality, which is that there is, there is money being spent. There are resources being used. But if the people who are um, in charge of, of, of delivering a service, if they're not doing it to the best of their ability for a range of reasons, then even those resources are not giving us the value that we need. Um, and again, without quality, access may be irrelevant. Large gaps exist between what doctors know and what they actually do. See, the focus is mainly on doctors. Um, and then we talk about non-physician clinicians, that they may produce um, as good or better health outcomes than fully trained doctors, but can they manage cases that complicate? And my work with mid-level health workers, which has gone over uh, a number of years, shows that they're very good. So nurse anesthetists, for example, or um, in countries where um, surgical technicians have been taught how to do cesarean sections, they're great for, let's say, 90% of the operations that they do, but they're not trained to deal with the complications as they arise. And then those are the cases that go into the statistics um, as being the maternal deaths and so on. So they're great at doing the routine cases that you can do as a technician almost, but they can't handle those difficult cases. Now, it's probable that neither can a junior doctor who's just done two years in a tertiary hospital who then gets sent out to a, a district hospital. And so what are we comparing when we're looking at data? And isn't there a better way that we can do this? So the case I'm making here is that I am talking about sexual and reproductive health rights, but I'm also talking about those rights from the point of view of the professionals who are trying to apply them, and recognizing that a barrier to SRH rights on the part of communities, men and women, the barrier may actually be the health professionals. And I'm trying to look at how we can be more effective within the resources that we've got which also gives us a basis for advocacy, um, in particular identifying weaknesses that can be resolved, but not to emphasize not to blame and shame individuals. So in talking about the work environment, I think an important uh, a point that's often missed is that when you have a poor work in environment and everybody feels like they're in a poor work environment, they don't have the resources, often when you talk to people and say, what's, what's the reason why you can't do what you want to do? They say, oh, we're overworked. Oh, we, we have shortages of staff. But as the BMJ article showed, quite often when you look at the workload of people, they're, they, they, they're not overwhelmed with work. I think one of the statistics that was showed was that maybe you have five patients a day, but at the end of it, you still feel as though you've, you've gone through a huge workload. And that's the level of burnout that actually our, our health staff are facing through trying to do things in a situation where they're not supported. Um, and in particular, this issue about not being valued. And I want to make this case very strongly. Because when we talk about mid-level health workers, non-physician cl clinicians, whatever we call them, and we talk about them as a stopgap, 
Okay, we'd really rather have a doctor doing this, but since we don't have enough doctors, you'll have to do one until we can get one. Why should they feel why should they feel motivated to do the work they're doing? And they see themselves as a stopgap. We even say to them, we're going to invest in you because you can't go abroad like a doctor can. You're not going to migrate. So we're going to invest in you. And then we expect that person to work the best they can and and feel valued when we're actually devaluing their contribution at that same time. So in studies that have looked at maternal deaths, um, and I want, maternal deaths are still a rare uh, occasion, even in, in our context in, in Southern Africa, but it's used as an indicator of quality of, of a service. Um, and maternal deaths, actually, to prevent them, we're not talking about primary health care. I think Deborah Main made that point a long time ago that actually there's no amount of education or poverty reduction that's going to prevent maternal deaths if you don't have good quality health services. Because you can educate. We have a situation where women come and they stay in waiting shelters. They may be there for two weeks. And then they walk into the hospital and die of a hemorrhage, even though they've done everything correctly because the hospital isn't geared to look after them. So wherever you do a maternal death inquiry, substandard care is, is a big contributing factor. And then we know that for every death, there are at maybe up to 30 cases of morbidity, which are called near misses. And this is the international experience of why we have these underlying, uh, why we have these maternal deaths. So the, people don't recognize when something is serious. They don't call in a senior when they need to. They don't know how to intervene. They don't follow up on outcomes to see what the learning was. There's poor teamwork. There's poor communication. Now, these are things that don't necessarily need more money. But the people who are working at the cool face need to have people who value them and think they're important enough to support them. And another quote from a junior doctor in one of the cities was, he was told by his next senior, he says, I'll come and help you this once, but you ever call me again, and you'll have to redo your rotation. So again, there's no incentive to call people, so you muddle through and you do the best you can. And that's a lot of junior doctors' experience. So we need this culture of patient safety, and how do we get that? Uh, so Farah and I did this root cause analysis of maternal deaths in Botswana in 2012. At the time in Botswana, it's a population of 2 million people. We figured that if they could reduce the number of maternal deaths, say by 80, 50, 80, they would meet their millennium development goals. So how do you reduce 50 to 80 maternal deaths? When we did the root cause analysis, we, um, we were reading about air crashes and this whole way in which um, uh, the underlying factors are identified with air crashes. And this magic number came up that for every air crash, it's not one human error. It's usually four to seven contributory factors. And that was the same figure that came up in our maternal death review. So it's the, it's the Swiss cheese diagram, the reasons um, Swiss cheese diagram, which shows that you've got barriers and hazards. If the holes in the cheese are big enough, they let the hazard through. And so you have to make those holes smaller. Because when they line up, that's how the hazard goes through into a death. So these are the solutions. And the key one is leadership. Now, if the leader that you're expecting to reform your service or strengthen your system is busy in private practice, as we heard before from, from the earlier speaker, then they're not providing leadership to junior doctors or to midwives or to um, other, other cadres. We have a very blaming, shaming culture in many parts of, of Southern Africa. And so having a, an inclusive approach, constructive morale building, these are all solutions that don't cost extra money, not much money, a little bit of training money. Um, and some of the things have been implemented, like this issue about the postnatal period. It used to be that women would um, deliver and then go straight on to the postnatal ward and be discharged the next day. And I think the data showing that most of the deaths happen around the first 48 hours after, after delivery made a big impact in changing that. But again, it depends on um, what is available for people. You'd be surprised to hear that in many wards, they don't have handovers. Okay? Um, in, in Botswana, the nurses did their own ward round and the doctors did their ward round. 
and they wrote notes to each other in the records. The Cuban doctors write their notes in Spanish. So where's the team working in that? And when you ask them, can you write them in English? They were like, why? They're my notes. They're for me to look at. Uh, so these are all changes in attitude. And then using the critical incident approach, which is what the maternal death reviews are often about. So in the surgical outcome study, which Zimbabwe contributed um, a near complete set of data, which reported in the Lancet last year, the main surgery that's performed in, in Africa, in Southern Africa anyway, is cesarean sections, so it's obstetrics. So there's a huge surgical unmet need. Okay, is this primary health care? Clearly not. It's usually what we call secondary health care, but at least based in a district hospital. So women who are suffering disability from um, vaginal fistula, for example, that has to be repaired in a hospital. Usually they're done in camps but you don't get continuity of care that way. Um, uh, cervical cancer, women who are identified through VIAC, visual inspection um, of the cervix, often they're finding cases of cancer. It's not a case of pre-cancer that can be prevented. Where do they go for treatment? Where do they go for surgery? At present, it's not being done. Women are being sent home to die of cancer. And even the Caesar section rate doesn't meet the, the level. Sometimes people say, but isn't that good? Well, no, it isn't, because you'd expect a certain proportion of seizures. They have to be done in a hospital. That's not primary health care. But if we're trying to prevent um, maternal deaths and, prevent and, and improve quality, we need an improved health system. So that's community, primary health care, secondary health care. And for that small number of cases that need referral, there should be a method of referring them. We have to have all that system working. So in the ASOS study, they found that most of the patients who died were young patients. Um, the mortality in that study showed that in Africa, it's twice the global average. And a big part of it was post-operative care. So again, it's quality. And that complications were not picked up or managed aggressively. So even in some of the cases we saw, women would get transferred from a Caesar. Instead of just spending a couple of hours in a recovery room, they were going straight onto an overcrowded postnatal ward, which meant that the nurses were too busy to pick them up. So there's a, a single intervention there that would make a difference. But because there isn't sufficient leadership, it's not happening. So this is the link between staff morale and quality. Um, Staff who are burnt out for all sorts of reasons, not being recognized, et cetera, at the end of it, they don't care what people think of them. And particularly, you know, if, they, if nobody's watching them, then they'll be playing with Facebook on their phones on the ward. Okay? It's not because they're not caring people. It's because they've, they haven't been invested in to the level where they care about their work because they're, they're not valued. So I want to show you an intervention that we brought in. It was funded, actually, through my writing to friends and asking for money for training. We didn't, go, we didn't get money from donors. They didn't think it was important. Um, and we ran a small pilot project with 30 midwives, a 12-week training package where we taught them about respectful maternity care. And this is initiated by the White Ribbon Alliance. And a key part of this was actually teaching them about um, the human rights of women in labor. So the right to confidentiality, the right to be treated with dignity, the right to privacy, the right to have a birth companion. And it was amazing that the midwives, when they were taught about it from a rights perspective, they were actually like, oh, OK, yeah, then maybe we should do that. And it was like, but hadn't that occurred to you before? And it was like, well, we've never been taught about human rights before. So that was quite a shock to me. Let me just read you this case to show you about social distance. There's social distance between the midwife and the patient, the woman in labor. And there's also social distance between um, the midwife and her senior, who's usually an obstetrician or a medical officer. I requested the obstetrician to come to see a woman post-delivery who was showing signs of shock. She was not bleeding, but her BP was dropping and she was agitated. The doctor said to continue. The woman was probably attention-seeking. 
I had to ask the matron to call the doctor who finally came, and in theater it was confirmed that the woman was bleeding internally from a ruptured uterus. I was proud, this is the midwife speaking, I was proud that I had identified this woman as being at risk and that I was able to assert myself to insist that the doctor came. Now she said that this was because of the training. Okay, the training consisted of reflective writing in diaries, sharing the experience with the other midwives, and then reinforcing these behaviors in each other. Very straightforward and very simple. But what it did was, it made these midwives realize that they had resources that they hadn't been encouraged to use before. And that means improvements in quality. So did they meet the reproductive health rights of their patients? She thanked me wholeheartedly and I was so touched. She said I explained well and I was patient with her and I was happy to know that I'd made a change to a woman who was said to be uncooperative. That's a word you hear a lot in midwifery uh, in, in wards, women who are uncooperative. So this is, instead of giving lectures on in, in, uh, education, it's doing one-to-one -one education with women. Before the RMC training, I would have shouted and scolded the girl. Why didn't she book? Why had she kept the pregnancy a secret to the family? I would have blamed her. Why had she slept with an unknown person without protection and got pregnant? But following the training, I treated her with love and caring, explaining everything that was happening and the reason for transfer. So this is the sexual and reproductive health rights of, the, of a 17-year-old girl being met by the midwife being treated with respect, so she then treated her patient with respect. That's the um, paper, if anyone's interested in it. So I, I'm just concluding by saying that we, we may not have the resources in our situation, we may not have the resources to pay for huge things, for, for new wards, for new health centers, but we have a human resource that we're actually not treating well enough and that by treating them with respect, by making them feel valued, even in a situation, Zimbabwe right now is an economic and political disaster. You, most people don't expect anything good to be coming out of it. And yet we've now got this program, which was entirely, let's say, fun, crowdfunded, um, and uh, we've, we received a grant recently from, from Wales for Africa, to develop a toolkit. It's going into the curriculum of some of the universities um, as part of their midwifery training. And each of those midwives that we trained is teaching people in her workplace as a, what they, they call themselves RMC champions. So I think there we've, we've done something which has given people hope. And I think if we can replicate that on a larger scale, but the ownership is entirely within this group of people. It's not donor funded, it wasn't dictated by anyone, um, it was a, a non-governmental organization that helped us and uh, you know maybe that's, that's how we have to proceed because everything else has too many strings attached. Thank you. <laughs>